This is The Meaningful Way. I'm your host, Luke Iorio. I love it when we get to tell some of the untold stories, the stories that talk about hope, the stories that talk about contribution, as well as the stories of everyday people who are doing extraordinary things. And this is one of those episodes. I have the pleasure today of being joined by Hunter Franks. Hunter Franks creates art that intervenes in the social and physical landscape of our urban environments. His participatory installations in public space break down barriers and help us reimagine our relationships with each other, our neighborhoods, and our cities. Projects include a 500-person dinner on a freeway, a storytelling exchange to connect disparate neighborhoods, a public display of first love stories, and a vacant warehouse turned into a community hub. His neighborhood postcard project has been carried out in 23 communities from Chennai, India to Santiago, Chile, and his League of Creative Interventionists has chapters in cities around the world from Cologne, Germany to Akron, Ohio. In 2011, he walked from Los Angeles to New Mexico, an experience that continues to fuel his desire to tell the stories of underrepresented people and places. And with that, Hunter, thank you so much for joining us here on The Meaningful Way. Thanks for having me. I think maybe a, a, a good place for us to begin is, how is it that you you came to such a place and of, of passion for interacting with and truly becoming an advocate for some of the under, underrepresented people and places? You know, essentially, why is this the cause that you've taken up? Yeah, uh, it's been a journey for sure. I think that um, I... I recognize now, I maybe didn't at the time, but I recognize now that high school was sort of the the formation of, of recognizing that um, people that didn't look like me or live in the same neighborhood as me or have the same interests as me also had a lot of value to their story and a lot of potential for um, to create meaningful relationships with them. Um, I, I went to a, I grew up in Los Angeles and I went to a high school that um, a lot of the the school was bused in um, from around the city, myself included, and it was in a, a higher income, primarily white neighborhood. Um, so there was a lot of socioeconomic mixing. And, um, you know, at the time, I had no idea what that was or why it was even important. But that was sort of the first, my first understanding of, um, of yeah, just meeting yeah. folks that didn't, um, didn't come from the same place that I did. Um, from there, I I went off to, to college and um, after college traveled for a couple of years, which also had a large influence on um, on my sort of understanding of, of how I, I see the world um, and how I see the importance and value of, of stories in, in our daily lives. Um, I then came to, to San Francisco with, uh, with the intent to still be a graphic designer, which I was doing at the time and sort of by... Um, by chance stumbled upon uh, the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation and um, was lucky enough to, to get a job there. And that was when I sort of started to learn about the, the professional side of, of storytelling and of public art and of all these things that, um, that I didn't really know existed before in, right. in that sense. And I had you know no idea what civic innovation was before that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I was exposed to that and started to think about how I could take what I loved uh, growing up, which was art and design, and use it to make an impact in the world more so than just putting a pretty poster on the wall, but thinking about how that poster could, um, you know, could cause someone to, to take action or to think about something differently. Um, so, so yeah, it's been, it's been kind of a journey and um, that was, that was the catalyst and I sort of dove in and, um, and really just listen to what I saw as, um, as a need from, from at that time at the mayor's office from people I was working with youth in particular in, um, in a certain neighborhood in San Francisco, um, and started the neighborhood postcard project at that time. And it sort of just took off and, uh, been doing it ever since. So, so was that actually one of the, the, that was the very first kind of project that allowed this to take off was the actual postcard yeah. project? Yeah. So I was, um, I was working at the mayor's office of civic innovation and we were working with youth in the Bayview neighborhood here in San Francisco where I live and Bayview is um, extremely negatively represented in the media. You hear, you know, there's a crime, a shooting, a killing, um, and there's a lot of crime there for sure compared to the rest of the city, but you don't ever get to hear any of the positive stories that are coming out of there. And so we got 
to work with youth to think about how to change the perception of their neighborhood. Um, and that was when I, I just left the mayor's office at that at that time. And so I was still that was still on my mind, and I was thinking about it as I sort of embarked into the world as an artist. Um, and I thought, you know, there's there's a simple way to do that, which is to tell some of the positive stories that are happening and try to get them to people throughout the city. Um, you know, that being said, someone's not going to go to this neighborhood that they think is scary and kind of out of the way and go hang out there all day and sure. you know, get to know the people and visit there. So I thought you have to take that to them. So, so for, the for, postcard, for, yeah. Yeah, for, for, every, for everybody listening, can you, can you explain exactly how the postcard project worked? Yeah. So we collect some personal positive stories um, from participants in the neighborhood, usually at, at an event or sometimes we'll partner with a small community organization. Um, we take those stories and then mail them to entirely random people in different neighborhoods. So I just go through the phone book and, and pick, pick an address. Um, so there, that person is receiving a surprise postcard with a personal and positive story of a neighborhood that either they've only probably heard the bad things about before, or maybe they've never heard of at all. Um, and then once they receive that, it's sort of, um, you know, up to them to decide what to do with it. The, the information for the website is on there. So it's been a couple of times um, that have been really, really amazing that we've had the opportunity to bring together the sender and recipient of the mm-hmm. postcard to meet in person for the first time. And those experiences are just really, really uh, powerful and impactful. And we, each time we come away realizing that the people have much more uh, in common than they, than they realize that they do. And they're much more similar than they are different. Yeah. And so I think that's the power of the project is just allowing the space for people to sit down and recognize that, um, that they're very, very similar yeah. Um, in, in many aspects that they may not have, you know, have recognized that they've just been walking past each other down the street. Right, right. Actually, I, I want to come back to that sentiment because I know it relates to one of the other projects you've got going on, the fear project going on. I don't want to come back to that in a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, but before we do, I guess one of the questions I, you know, I have, which uh, I think is, is you know, something that, that a lot of listeners out there, they you know, may have going through their own mind is, you know, you're, you're on the, the road less traveled in terms of some of the things that you're doing. And at some point with that project, and I'm sure even the projects that you launched today, the you know incredible 500 plate project and everything else, there's that moment where you just say, you know what, this is what I'm doing and I'm going for it. And I'm just curious, what, you know, what is it? What is that process that, that you go through that allows an idea to take hold where you just say, I'm going for it. I, you know, let's go, let's do this. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. I, I don't know that there's, necessarily one moment in any in any given project i think that for me i've been extremely lucky to have support from uh from funders Mm -hmm. which obviously makes a huge difference a lot of my work is is grant funded um Mm -hmm. i also think it's something that's not discussed or talked about enough nearly enough um because this work you know does not it's not just oh i have a passion and now i'm going to pursue it and that's it um you know there's a lot of of work that goes in of me, you know, sitting on my computer, filling out budget spreadsheets and, you know, <laughs> things that, um, is not necessarily, you know, me sure. living my, my fullest dream, so to speak, <laughs> but it's, it's part of the necessary work, um, that allows for the, the amazing moments to, to happen. Um, sure. and so I think, yeah, I think having that support is, is a big part of it. Um, mm-hmm. and prior to that support, I think is, is relationships and being able to build, um, you know, relationships that you, that you can count on to, to help support you and, and get right. the word out about your work. I, you know, my first funding opportunity came from the Knight Foundation, a, a large foundation that um, supports several uh, mm-hmm. communities where the Knight Brothers own newspapers throughout the country. Um, and that was from an introduction from a, from a friend and colleague who, you know, liked the work I was doing and wanted to, to support it. So she, you know, she recognized and was willing to, to help me um, sort of make that introduction. And because of that, I then, you know, got to go to another conference and meet someone else. So it did sort of, mm-hmm. you know, like, like anything in, in life, I think um, is based heavily upon relationships. Um, and so having the ability to, to be able to reach out to someone and say, Hey, I have this idea. Like, what do you, you know, what do you think about it? Um, right. Is, is probably the, the thing that's most important in terms of, um, you know, finding out how to, Mm-hmm. how to get to the work. Now there's still a lot that goes into it in terms of, Absolutely. you know, uh, self, self doubt and the challenges that arise throughout any, any given project, it's not, you know, 
It's not right. that I had an idea to, um, to create a giant meal on a freeway and the next day it was, you know, it happened. <laughs> right. um, there's a right. lot, a lot of, uh, yeah, of challenges and of, you know, of, of difficulties and, um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of, uh, of work that goes, that goes into that. So I think the, not so much even having a moment and the sort of, I'm just going to do this thing, but, mm -hmm. um, but having, having this sort of mindset and knowing that, you know, I have a list of, uh, of unfunded ideas and rejected applications that I always keep on my wall. Sure. Um, and it's, you know, it's a growing list and that list is three times as long as the list of projects that I've done. And so I think sure. that that's a, probably the most important thing is to just recognize that, that, um, that sort of mindset that you sure. are going to ultimately have a lot of projects that just don't work or don't get funded. Um, right. and yeah, the long, the longevity of, of perseverance is, is probably the, the most paramount part of completing sure. any project. Well, sure. And I, you know, I think there's, there's a couple things in there, you know, you know, for, for, for one, uh, for everybody, even just to be aware that even inside of local governments, there may be a function for civic innovation. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's where, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with some of the stuff that's gone on even locally here for where, where I'm based uh, near Jersey city, all the attention that's gone to the use of urban spaces and urban farming and, and new projects that are, that are kicking up through those types of efforts. It's one to be aware of what's really going on and to get tuned into it. And then I like what you're, you know, what you're reminding everybody of is that I think there's a second part of the relationships that you didn't quite say, but the relationships being the foundation of it. I think the second part is putting yourself in proximity. And so if you, yeah. you know, your relationships are putting you in proximity to those that can fund it or back it or support it or introduce you to other people, you're, 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 you're already halfway through the, you know, the door as it were to at least the possibility of something occurring and mm -hmm. you've put yourself in that position to, to be there. And so, you know, that's one of the things I really want to encourage everybody out there is that, you know, you're, you're into some really interesting projects. You can you know, check out creativeinterventionists.com uh, and check out some of the stuff that's there. But there's ways of getting involved in this type of stuff to learn it, get close to it, and then see where your ideas take you. And I guess, yeah. you know, Hunter, for you, I'm, I'm curious, what is it that you would say, like with all of the ideas, the ones that have been funded, the ones that haven't, what would you say are some of the, you know, what's the theme? What's the, the, the thing that kind of bonds all of this work together? Because they're... There definitely seems to be uh, that attention to, you know, uh, I guess, bridging the socioeconomic divide among a mm -hmm. bunch of your projects. But I'm, I'm curious, is that it? Or or what else do you feel really bonds the the, the total totality of the projects you're launching? Yeah, for me, it's, um, it's creating invitations for people to, to reimagine the world the way mm -hmm. that it is. I think that um, it is... A, a shame that we are told to um we're told that success looks a certain way we're told that um our function in in daily life looks a certain way we're told that our how we move through the city should look a certain way um we're told that our relationships should look a certain way um and so i think there's it's really hard for people myself included to to sometimes be able to to see things differently than they are and, and to recognize that um that there's other ways that, that things can be done and that it doesn't have to, you don't have to wait for, for someone else, whether it's mm -hmm. the city government to, you know, create a bike lane on your street or whether it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, your neighbor to say hello to you or whether it's you, um, simply expressing your, your love for, uh, for your parents, whatever it may be. I think, um, what I, what I hope my work allows is for a, a greater sense of, of connection between people and a greater sense of shared empathy between people. Mm -hmm. And the design and the products on the end of it is, um, is not as important as the process and the space created yeah. before that. Um, yeah. So if I can create a space for people to, to be curious and to connect with each other and to, um, to really recognize that, um, that they have the power to create the life and the city that they want to create um, is is really the the thread that combines all of it together. Now there are exactly. things on top of that, like you mentioned, that mm -hmm. I think are important, like socioeconomic mixing. Um, the fact that you know we are um, in many large cities, you know, segregated still yeah. by race and income, um, and you know I think there's there's great value to to hearing stories that are not yours and to interacting with people that are not like you. I think that adds extreme value to, to any life. Um, mm -hmm. so that's definitely a large, a large theme as well. But, um, yeah, I think the, uh, 
the overarching theme throughout all of it is just is creating ways for people to sort of um, to live their their fullest lives and to do so both in the, the social aspects mm-hmm. of their of their life and also thinking about the the physical landscapes that they move through every right. day and how that can can balance that. Well, I love I love the frame of of you know reimagining uh, the world or reimagining your world. Uh, even and and what you have, have brought into that, I think the the other couple of qualities and, and and attributes that you brought out there in terms of curiosity, connection, and shared empathy as well, uh, feeds into why I had a curiosity myself around mm-hmm. what has been labeled the fear project. And I was hoping you mm-hmm. could talk a little bit about what you know what is that, uh, what's going on there, and, and again what the focus of of the fear project is. Yeah, so I think we have very few. Well, very few spaces at all and very, very few public spaces to share any sort of introspection. We have some some places to share joy, you know, music concerts, mm-hmm. uh, sporting events, that sort of thing in public. Um, but we don't really have very many opportunities to share sadness, which I think is, you know, like, again, when it comes to reimagining is yeah. an equally valid emotion as, as happiness and joy, but gets a very negative stigma yeah. in, in our society. Um we don't have very many places to share that and to share fears and, and sort of deeper introspections. Um, and so, yeah, I started the, the Fear Doctor Project uh, with the League of Creative Interventionists, I think two years ago was the first time I did it and um, didn't really resurrect it until until recently. Um, and the project consists of, uh, of me or, or someone from, from the League just setting up a, a booth and inviting people to come and share a fear that they have, and then we write them on the spot um, on a little typewriter a free philosophical prescription for their fear. So okay. it can look like love or compassion or patience or you know a couple deep breaths. Um, thinking about ways to, to sort of help them through that fear. Um, it is extremely powerful what people will share mm-hmm. with you as a total stranger. I think they'll share more with a total stranger than they will with a best friend sometimes. Um, okay. And so, you know, I've, I've heard so many amazing stories and so many interesting fears and um, recognize that the things that hold people back are very common mm-hmm. in, in many cases. Um, and that's been, that's been an interesting sort of outcome of the project. And then also seeing how, how much it touches some people. I think, you know, I often struggle with, with projects like that of wondering how much impact they make and, you know, how do I tell the story around it and how do we uh, as an organization, you know, use it to further our goals and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then you sit down with someone and they, you know, you write them a prescription and, um, or they come up, you know, they, they come up and are yelling at first and, uh, you know, don't know maybe what's going on. There's a lot of, or I have carried out the project frequently on six and market street in downtown San Francisco. There's a lot of challenges with mental health and drug use and things of that nature. Um, so sometimes, you know, like one time this one lady came up and was sort of yelling and wondering what the project was. And I told her about it and she agreed to sit down. And at the end of it, you know, she said she was so, so grateful and said she's going to keep it in her wallet. And she gave me a hug. And so it's those sort of connections that I don't necessarily anticipate that have been really, really powerful as well to see how much it means to people sometimes yeah. just to have someone listen to them um, yeah. has been has been amazing. So I continue to do the project. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just been uh, a wonderful experience. I, I love that sentiment of having spaces for introspection, because uh, mm-hmm. that is so spot on with, you know, the, the things that are almost the acceptable social norms of how we celebrate certain emotions. And, and, you know, like you said, the joy and the happiness and camaraderie and things like that, but to be able to have those spaces and openness for introspection and the conversation and the connection and the empathy that that can create uh, is it really is extraordinary. Um, that's a that's a fantastic fantastic project. Thank I guess you. maybe Thank one you. of the, one of the things that um, actually let me let me before I before I shift let me just ask this: what you know what might be just one other project that you're you're working on right now that you're just really excited about and excited about where it could go? Yeah. Um, well, there's one that I I can't yet disclose is is not. Uh, <laughs> official to the press yet that I'm excited about, but, um, there is, there's a project that, um, or I'm doing more work, uh, this year again in, in Akron, Ohio, um, mm-hmm. with the Knight Foundation, with support from the Knight Foundation. Um, and we're working on a very neighborhood specific level, which I okay. have not done before, um, to, to the extent that we are this year. Um, mm-hmm. 
And so, yeah, it's just been, it's been really wonderful to, to work in the same place for, yeah. for a year almost now. Um, and just to, to create relationships and to recognize that, um, that listening is such a key to what we do. And I think I didn't necessarily recognize that, uh, maybe a year, a year and a half ago that, you know, uh, oftentimes as a young white male going into neighborhoods that, um, can either be predominantly of color or, or lower income. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I recognize my, my, my privilege going in and that I am also an outsider that, um, you know, does not live in that neighborhood every day. And so it's always a bit of a, a challenge to, sure. to navigate that. Um, and so being able to show up consistently, uh, in, in this neighborhood, some at Lake, the neighborhood in Akron, um, and, and really just, yeah, create, create relationships and, um, and projects and then a body of work that we are continuing to, to do that, um, that allows us to, um, to, yeah, to recognize that how, how key the, the listening phase is, I think, again, design and, and products are so, um, often what is seen at the end of a project that, you know, you created this cool, this cool new, uh, you know, outdoor furniture or whatever, uh, you know, it, it may be. Um, and so we, we recently started working with youth, particularly in, in the Summit Lake neighborhood in Akron. And so mm-hmm. we recruited about 10, 12 youth, um, and some builders, fabricators, experienced builders, fabricators, and paired them together, um, what we call calling the, the build core. Um, and we, mm-hmm. we spent a day just building benches out of pallets that they can then put in the neighborhood. And so, so the, the, what we were attempting to do is create a sense of ownership and investment from the youth there. So that when they walk by that bench in the future, they can think, Oh, I, you know, I built that bench. Um, this is, this is mine. I can affect the place that I, that I live in. Um, so we're experimenting with that same model of the build for in San Francisco now and hoping to, to make it be a, a larger part of, all of our projects as well. Cause I think that if, with youth in particular, having, um, having that ability to, to allow them to see that the place that they live yeah. can be shaped by them mm-hmm. is not something that enters their, their conscious on a regular basis. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. I guess for, for those that, you know, that want to start getting involved in, in these types of projects and, and find different ways of, of, you know, contributing and taking on or, or creating some type of an intervention, uh, within their own communities, what's just some of the, you know, maybe the advice or the lessons that you can share in terms of, you know, how to get started, how to, to, to get yourself moving, uh, towards the creation of one of these projects. Yeah, I think you have to do it for free for a while. Um, yeah. I mean, you don't have to, but mm-hmm. I, I certainly did. And I think many, many people do, um, you know, I, I didn't make any money as an artist for the first, at least six months that I was doing this type of work. And slowly but surely someone said, Hey, I'll give you a you hundred know, dollars to come do this or $500. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and now I would not, you know, most likely not do any project where I was only getting a hundred dollars as, you know, as right. a project budget. So that's sort of, it, it shifts and it grows, which is really exciting. Um, but for, yeah, for a while you just, unless you have some sort of, uh, you know, in, you have to, you have to really hustle extremely hard, um, and go and do things for free. It's, uh, unfortunate sort of, um, necessity of, of being a uh, creative in our society. But, um, uh, with that being said, I think I also early on recognize opportunities for, um, for, for funding and for, right. for making those connections. So I would go to events that, um, that I knew were, you know, going to have people, uh, mm-hmm. essentially collaborate with or people who were interested or mm-hmm. people who had projects that I could join up with. Um, so I think that was, that was one of the first things I did was I didn't necessarily have my own projects yet, but I, you know, I started to join other people's projects, um, and sort of think about how to navigate that. Um, mm-hmm. and then I, yeah, I applied for a grant from the awesome foundation, which is in quite a few cities. Um, mm-hmm. it's basically 10 people get together all throw in a hundred dollars and give out a thousand dollar grant, uh, once mm. a month. Um, so that was my very, very first grant was a $1,000 grant from them to do the postcard project here in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, it, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of, um, 
sort of persistence um, right. and, and knowing that, you know, there will be, um, you know, something uh, more substantial in terms of, um, mm-hmm. in terms of funding uh, further down the line. But I think that that's always sure. the big challenge early on sure. is that people, you know, they don't have the, the capacity or the ability to, you know, to not make significant mm-hmm. money for a while, mm-hmm. um, which is unfortunate, but I think that, um, that's sort of the necessary mm-hmm. first step is to, to forming those relationships and just going out to, you know, events that you think are cool and will have other creative people yeah. at, um, and then talking to them because chances are that, you know, they know someone who knows someone who knows someone who sure. has funding or who has a project you can link up with, um, so- as well. So then let me, let me ask you if we, we pivot, uh, you know, slightly in a direction. I'm just curious in, in the, you know, the years now of doing these projects, this work, uh, seeing some of the incredible ripple effect that it's had and, you know, some of the wonderful support and backing that you've had. I'm curious, how, how do you feel that this work and being able to do this work has changed you? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a great question. I think that, you know, early, early on I had a lot of, um, creativity and, uh, and was also pretty naive in, in terms of how this, this work goes. Um, I, I didn't understand, you know, the, the reporting for impact metrics or, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, I didn't understand the thinking around organizational, design. I didn't think around, I didn't think about all these, these sorts of things. I was just doing the thing that I wanted to do in right. the world. Um, and so I, I, I try to hold on to that, uh, as, as much as possible with, with all of the, the things that come out of that, that require, you know, thinking about an organization as a business and, um, you know, actually making money off of it and paying other people and all these sorts of things right. that come up. So, so it has changed in, in that regard, um, in that, you know, it's, um, it's more, it's more work, I think, than, than it used to be, um, which is also really exciting at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in terms of sort of emotionally, um, I, I recognize that, um, that I am no more of an expert in this than mm-hmm. anyone else. Um, and that, you know, I think there's great power in that, that a 10 year old in, you know, a neighborhood that we're working in can have amazing, brilliant ideas that I could never dream of. Um, yeah. and so I recognize that there's extreme power in, in other people's ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's really also just solidified my, um, my knowing a hundred percent that we as humans desire to have connection with each other. Um, and the fact that, you know, we're not looking other people in the eye on, on the subway or that we have our earphones plugged in. Um, you know, it's, it's not, I don't expect everyone to be best friends all the time out there, but I do think that we're oftentimes missing great opportunities to learn from each other. Um, and I think that, yeah, I've, I've recognized that, um, a new level of, of softness, within myself that, that recognizes those moments and that potential so that when, you know, when I am walking down a busy street somewhere and someone is, you know, uh, on the side of the street and I'm asking for change or someone is, you know, uh, running around yelling, uh, mm-hmm. whatever it may be, obscenities. Um, I recognize that everyone is equally as, as human as I am. And just because they are in a certain scenario or look a certain way, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make them any less of an amazing person than I think yeah. that I am or that anyone is. Yeah. Um, so that, that has really changed and then opened up for me in ways that, um, that I don't think I necessarily had access to three mm-hmm. or four years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's the exactly as you set out with with some of the curiosity and, and connection and empathy that you you th- sought to bring out in some of these projects. You've you've brought that out in in your own development, uh, your own evolution, yeah. as it were. So I guess maybe yeah. Matt, now is a time you know good time for us to to uh, you know bring this this conversation full circle. And I I you know love asking my guests uh, that you know at this point in in your life and your journey and your career, 
what is it that you would say is your meaningful way to live and work? Yeah, I think, um, I think my, my meaningful way is, is relatively, um, is, is relatively slow. Um, it, it, it likes to, to listen a lot and observe a lot. Um, I think that I, you know, coming back to, to the thing about creating a business, it's not, um, it, it's not necessarily the, the fun side of, of all of it. Um, and, and the, the meaningful side, uh, it's, it's necessary, but I think the, the meaningful side is, is really being able to, to show up and have ideas that, um, that can support other people and also to, um, to allow for that to, to be present in my everyday life. Um, so that when I'm out there, you know, doing whatever it is that I do, I recognize that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be and that I am, um, you know, that I'm fully present in that, in that moment. Um, and then I also recognize that there's, you know, a lot of people who, um, who are in situations that are not, or don't have that sort of freedom or are not able to necessarily pursue their passion. Um, and so for me, it's extremely meaningful to be able to provide um, opportunities to advance equity and to strengthen neighborhoods, because I think that that, um, that allows for, for a greater shared sense of, of humanity and a greater um, sense of uh, accomplishment for, for everyone in mm-hmm in the world. And obviously, you know, I I don't think that this type of work will ever solve homelessness or, you know, uh, world hunger or anything of of that nature. I think what, what this work can do is allow for, um, for people to recognize that, that culture and that, um, expression and creation are, are integral ways to be able to, to relate to each other and to create neighborhoods and cities. And I think that if we, can reimagine how we view each other um, sort of on a person to person level. Then we can reimagine how we interact within our neighborhoods. And then we can reimagine how we interact within our cities. And then we can reimagine how we interact within our country. Um, and I think that is, is sort of the crux of it all in terms of the, yeah. the meaning is really to, to figure out how to take uh, the individual way that we move through the world and amplify it up um, as, as big and as open as we can. Well, to, to borrow a line from, from John Lennon, we may say that you're a dreamer, but you're not the only one. And I really, <laughs> yeah. really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing what it is that you've helped reimagine, uh, as well as all of the, you know, the incredible work that you're doing and, and inspiration that you give to the people listening in today about what thank are you. some of the things that they can get done and what, what they can contribute to. So Hunter, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much. It was great. You know, and for everybody, I guess the, you know, the big thing then I would love to leave you with is exactly where Hunter started to wrap up, which is how is it that you can reimagine the way in which we understand and accept and get to know each other, the way in which we connect to each other? How is it you can reimagine the way in which we work together within our communities? And how is it that you can reimagine your world? I want to thank you once again for dropping in on The Meaningful Way. And as always, until next time, continue to enjoy the journey. Thanks for tuning in to The Meaningful Way. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and please subscribe and follow along with all these great guests, their stories and interviews. Also, it helps us a lot if you not only share some of your favorite episodes online, but also provide us feedback. Go into iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast app happens to be and rate the show. Provide us some feedback and let us know how it is that we're doing. If you want to learn more about what we're up to, whether it be with the IPEC Coach Training School, the Live, Lead, Play Network, or even just what's evolving with The Meaningful Way, go on and head on over to LukeIorio.com. Music.